You've been a witness to your entire life up until this very moment, from the very first breath you took all the way until right now, and everything that happened in between. Every single moment you've been a part of across space and time, all pieced together in one single chronological order of events. The things you've done, the core beliefs you hold, the people you've met, obstacles you've overcome, world events you've watched unfold from your own perspective, all of these things come together to create the story of you. A story that you've been writing for your entire life, one that has fun fundamentally shaped your perception of reality and the world around you. Your first kiss, your first heartbreak, learning to drive, watching a movie for the first time you didn't realize would later become a lifelong favorite. All of those things that happened to you, but not just how they happened, how you felt about them as well. And without these memories, who would you be? If you woke up tomorrow with no recollection of anything that happened before that moment, would you still be you? Your memory is the glue that holds the entire idea of you together. So how would it make you feel if I told you that you couldn't trust it at all? I want you to take a second and try and think about what is your very first memory as far back as you can go. At its core, a memory is your brain's way of storing and retrieving information about past experiences, facts, skills, or feelings. A way for you to carry the past into the present. But where people really start to misunderstand what's happening here is they assume their eyes work like some sort of video camera camera, and everything they see gets stored onto the hard drive that is their brain. But anytime they want, they can pull up that recording and play back everything that happened. But it doesn't actually work like that, and there are levels to this thing. The very first level of your memory is called your sensory memory, a very brief collection of information from your senses. What are you seeing, touching, tasting, smelling, and hearing in this exact moment? A high-resolution snapshot of everything happening right now. A temporary filter, allowing your brain to process process and decide which sensory inputs if any, are important enough to retain for future consideration, where they will then either fade into nothingness or be passed down to level two. Short-term memory temporarily holds information you learned for a few seconds to minutes and lives right here in your prefrontal cortex. On average, you can hold five to seven items in your short-term memory, like the digits of a phone number or a license plate ID, for about 15 to 30 seconds, keeping information available for immediate use before it's forgotten or moved on to level three. Long-term memory is a nearly permanent storage space to hold experiences and information you've learned. There there's no limit on how much information you can store here, and it stays in the storage space for years. Things like the landline phone number you had at your house when you were a kid, that weird piece of trivia you learned when you were 14, even what you ate for dinner last night are all long-term memories. But there are two different kinds, a declarative memory, which is the storage of facts, events, and locations, and an implicit memory, the storage space for learned skills, habits, and relationships. These long-term memories don't live in any one specific location, but they travel through the network of over 100 billion neurons inside of your mind, communicating through electrical impulses and chemical signals. Or so we thought. The concept of a grandmother cell was first proposed in the 1960s as a sort of humorous idea trying to explain how the brain represents complex information, and it suggested that there might be a single neuron, or a very small group of neurons, that fires when you recognize a highly specific stimulus like your grandmother's face. Now, this concept was viewed as highly absurd and very controversial at the time, and a lot of people argued that it was biologically impossible, because if you had one single neuron responsible for representing the entire concept of your grandma, what would happen if that one neuron died? So the idea was essentially put to bed until one day in 2005, when a UCLA neurosurgeon was operating on patients who suffer from debilitating epileptic seizures. Now, during brain surgery, patients are typically kept awake because your brain doesn't hurt once it's been opened up, and the doctor needs to make sure that they aren't causing damage to any critical areas that control speech, movement, and other functions. During these surgeries, he asked his patients if they'd be open to doing a little exploratory science while on the operating table, and a bunch of them said yes. So, he showed them a set of photographs, and he noticed that when shown pictures of Jennifer Aniston, a specific neuron in the brain of his patients would light up. When he showed them pictures of Julia Roberts, or random people, animals, or places, the neuron was quiet. But back to Jen, and it would light up once more, at any age, any hairstyle, any character she played, even 
even just by reading her name, showing us that it represented the entire concept of Jennifer Aniston. The Jennifer Aniston neuron isn't alone, and in the time since, the experiment has been repeated, and neurons have been found to flash for Julia Roberts, Halle Berry, Kobe Bryant, and more, showing us that there are actually specific neurons that are able to hold entire concepts of people, places, and things inside of our heads. With that in mind, it's easy to imagine our memory as this sort of massive, almost infinite library, with each neuron representing a book that has been filed and stored to recall later. But in reality, it's not really like that at all. Memories aren't stored as a fixed, unchanging set of information. They are reconstructed entirely when we retrieve them. And it is sort of like giving a photo of yourself to ChatGPT and asking it to recreate the image exactly, and then ask it to recreate the image again and again and again and again. And soon enough, this reconstructed image will look nothing like the original. And your memory works the exact same way, and they can be constantly distorted, colored by new information, or your current feelings. Now, ask ChatGPT to reconstruct that image, except this time, it's in a really bad mood, and this new angry reconstruction is going to affect all future reconstructions. Because every time you access a memory, it's more similar to your last reconstruction of it than the original event itself. And this becomes particularly challenging when we discuss the concept of repressed memories. The idea that a highly traumatic or stressful event can be unconsciously blocked from your conscious awareness as a form of psychological defense. Looking to challenge the idea of repressed memories, Elizabeth Loftus pioneered some of the most extraordinary and divisive studies that psychology has to offer, where she attempted to plant false memories into the brains of 24 adult participants. And we said, we've been talking with your mother. Uh, we found out some things that happened to you when you were about five or six years old. We'd like to see what you can remember about these experiences that your mother told us about. Participants were told three true experiences that had actually happened to them, and a false one of them being lost in a mall. Your mother told us that you were shopping at the at the corner uh, shopping mall on a Saturday one, one time, and you were by the pet store, and all of a sudden you disappeared, and you were gone for the longest period of time. And eventually we found you, you were crying, and an elderly woman had uh, rescued you and brought you back to the, the main office. Do you remember that experience? Surprisingly, she found that not only did 25% of them claim to remember this event that never actually happened, but many of them even invented additional details, like that the man that had found them had been wearing a plaid jacket, or what time of year it was, and other details that had never been mentioned by the research team. This showed Loftus that memory wasn't just vulnerable to time, but also manipulation, which she used to create her recipe for planting false memories. If you're looking to make someone remember something that never actually actually happened, it's actually pretty easy to do so, and you only need a couple of things. First, you need first, you need this person's trust. And it's typically easiest if you're in a position of authority, like a police officer, therapist, parent, etc. Then you suggest something that might have happened, and don't forget to bring in persuasive supporting evidence. All you need to do next is ask them if that is what they remember, and watch them take ownership of a memory that was never actually theirs. A good example of this could be someone that witnessed a crime, but never actually saw the criminal face, a police officer could place six pictures in front of them and ask them if any of the people looked familiar. The witness could apologize and say no, and all the police officer needs to do is say something along the lines of, I see your eyes keep making their way over to number four. It seems like you might recognize him. Do you? We have proof that that can be enough to construct a memory with false information. In the United States alone, over 375 people have been exonerated through DNA testing since 1989, and 70% of those original convictions came from eyewitness misidentification. In 2015, Dr. Julia Shaw was able to take this a step further, where over the course of three interviews with the same participants, she was able to convince 70% of them with false memories provided by their parents where they were the perpetrators of violent crimes in their early teenage years. Going from this in the first interview. Honestly, I don't remember. I don't, like, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I, I don't, I feel like I've, I don't think I've ever been in a fight. I'm so confused. Um, to this in 2015. just two sessions later. I think the cops showed up and we were kind of having a, maybe a, like a verb verbal kind of fight and then it kind of maybe got to a push. Mm -hmm. 
Memories are so malleable that even the language used when you're asked to recall something can greatly impact how you remember it. In 1974, another study was conducted, also by Elizabeth Loftus, where she and her partner showed participants seven different videos of car crashes. Afterwards, they would ask participants to recall how fast they thought the cars were going when the accident occurred, using different verbs like hit, smashed, or contacted. And time and time again, when verbs like smashed were used, the participants greatly overestimated how fast the cars were going compared to others who received verbs like contacted. Now, this gets even more interesting when we think of a very specific phenomenon that was born in 2009, when Fiona Broom was at a conference talking with some of her peers about the memory they shared of former South African president Nelson Mandela's death in a prison in the 1980s. But Nelson Mandela didn't die in the 1980s and was very much alive in 2009. After speaking with others at this conference about her memories, she learned that she wasn't the only one, and others even claimed they saw news coverage of his death and a speech by his widow. The broom didn't understand how such a large group of people could remember the same identical event that never actually happened, so she created a website to discuss what she called the Mandela Effect, and other incidents like it. Like how Looney Tunes was never actually spelt like that, the Berenstein Bears never existed, Curious George never had a tail, Febreze never had two E's, the Monopoly Man never wore a monocle, there was no hyphen in Kit Kat, and Fruit of the Loom never had a cornucopia. And the difference here is that this isn't a case of one false memory being implanted in the minds of a guinea pig in one psychological study, but an entire group of thousands, if not millions of people, falsely remember something that never was. Again, showing us just how strong of a role social reinforcement plays in our own memory. Or maybe you never remembered any of those things that way, and you only think you do because you hear it coming from me, and I'm telling you that a lot of other people also think that way. At the very least, some of the false memories you share with other people is just your brain filling in the gaps, and the Mandela Effect is living proof of what cognitive psychologists like Elizabeth Loftus have been trying to show us in experiments, that memory is a reconstruction every time we recall it, vulnerable to contamination by culture, expectation, or suggestion. Can we take it a step further? And the first thing that we need to consider when getting a little existential about this topic is the idea of the past. Because the past doesn't really exist. All that exists is the present moment, and what you think of as the past is just a previous present moment that now only exists inside of your mind, or your memory what we've been talking about for this entire video. And if you've been watching, you know that your memory isn't all that reliable. This idea was born somewhere in the 1990s, loosely based off the Omphalos hypothesis, which is a religious argument that God created the world with an apparent age. And the idea of last Thursdayism is exactly that. The entire universe could have sprung into existence last Thursday, only appearing to be old. And you could argue that we know the universe is billions of years old, that dinosaurs existed millions of years Ago, and we've had some form of civilization for thousands of years, but the idea here is that the universe could have popped into existence only appearing to be old. Books, fossils, light already on the way from distant stars, and literally everything, including your memories from before last Thursday, were all formed at the time of creation last Thursday. And while the odds that the universe was created last Thursday and all of your memories are things that never actually happened are pretty low, they're not zero. And the truth is, the majority of the memories inside of your brain that you believe to be true hold at least some form of inaccuracy. What I do know, for those of you that stayed till the end of this video, which thank you by the way, I want you to think back to that first memory I asked you to remember at the very start, and I'll tell you that about 40% of you are remembering something entirely fictional that never actually happened. 